It's Mountain Monday, and you know what to do. Breathe in. And out. And breathe in. And out. And we're going to need a lot of deep breaths this Mountain Monday because uh, happy 4th of July, first of all, to uh, Americans listening. And this is part of the reason that I am covering topics like this. Thanks, Dropbox, for making noise. Um, and if you guys hear weird popping sounds in the background, it's because somebody is setting off fireworks, even though it is neither Canada Day, as I record this, or the 4th of July. Someone is, I guess, trying to split the difference in my neighborhood. But um, yeah, a lot of people who listen to this, um, this YouTube channel, who watch this YouTube channel, are not, they don't live in Canada. And so when things happen in Canada, sometimes it's a little confusing. And I was watching my Twitter feed tonight, last night, for you guys listening, because this goes up the following day. And uh, there was a lot of discussion on Twitter about, our, our Pride Parade, which happened today, uh, or yesterday for the people watching, um, but there, there were a few things. The, the really positive thing was that uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, Premier Kathleen Wynne, and um, Mayor, the Mayor of Toronto, John Tory, uh, all marched in the Pride Parade. It's the first time a sitting Prime Minister has marched in the Toronto Pride Parade. And he, he got super soakered, the whole thing. And uh, more power to him because that was it for me with Pride. I got hit with a super soaker in the ear, like the, the stream of water. Uh, I had an ear infection for a week and that was it for me. No more Pride for me. Um, but, uh, you know, obviously it's nice to see this stuff. And the, the other marked thing is that John Tory, our mayor, is a conservative politician. He ran, he was the leader of the provincial uh, conservatives. Uh, didn't win that one, uh, the, the mayoral race. And uh, so it was a, a conservative politician municipally. Uh, premier Kathleen Wynne, the Premier of Ontario, she's a liberal. She's also herself a lesbian. And um, that she's a liberal and, and Justin Trudeau is a uh, is a liberal and so that was really cool that there was not only you know um, uh, multiple er multiple levels of government present but also you know different political parties represented I think I saw on Twitter that uh, Tom Mulcair from the NDP was there as well I know Olivia Chow who's the the widow of the former leader of the federal NDP, Jack Layton. She was there in a sparkly purple dress. Um, and uh, we've got this generation of, of politicians who are, are very um, united in support for gay rights. And that's really great. The controversial element of the day came uh, with a 30, through a 30 minute stop of the parade because Black Lives Matter protesters who were part of the parade, they were invited as, as honorary, um, honorary attendees, um, they, they stopped the parade. They sort of sat down in the street. Now, why did they sit down in the street? Because the, the slogan for this year's Pride Parade was, you can sit with us and uh, and this is where the politics start happening, and this is where I wanted to uh, talk about this because it's more complicated than a lot of people are going to be aware of. Um, a few years back, a lot of um, non-white elements of Pride Weekend were cut or significantly um, cut, you know, had their funding cut. And... Uh, so that's a large part of what they were protesting. So they were, you know, riffing on the, you can sit with us, well, we can't because we're not 
completely equal members of this celebration. And uh, it, it's undeniable if you, if you look at the, the pictures of, you know, that you see coming out of Pride. The racial makeup of Pride is not representative of the city as a whole, especially not the downtown. And so they have a point there. Um, the, the, some people are upset that they disrupted what was a historic day with the prime minister in attendance. Uh, some people have issues with that. Um, you know, the, the thing, and, and I'm not, I'm not going to give my thoughts quite yet. I'm just going to give you guys the facts. Um, the, the thing about pride is that yes, it's become something of a tourist attraction. It's actually not something very much of a tourist attraction in Toronto, but it's, it started as very much a, you know, political event. And so there's some divisions within pride, the people who liked it being a, a highly politicized event. And then the people who want it to be a tourist attraction, yay, Toronto, sort of, sort of a, a signature piece for the city. There's two camps. And um, so there's that background. The other thing people don't seem to understand is, you know, I saw a lot of people going, Black Lives Matter, Toronto, what did the cops do? You know, not ask permission before they wrote them a ticket. There, there actually are issues up here, you, you know, you don't hear about the, the heavy duty racism that, you know, is emblematic of places, say the US South, but it, it does happen. Um, there was a fairly recent case um, where a, a man by the name of Andrew Loku was shot by the police. Um, he was a, uh, uh, an immigrant, it was back in 2015, oh, it was almost a year ago. Um, and uh, he was from South Sudan and he had mental health challenges. And there was an issue with a neighbor, the cops were called, by the end of the night, Andrew Loku was dead. Um, you know, obviously, multiple sides to the story. Uh, that isn't the only one. There's another instance, and, and this there, there was shenanigans on this case. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Jermaine Carby was killed in 2014, uh, and evidence was tampered with at that crime scene. So the cops claimed he had a knife, but strangely the proof of that assertion went uh, AWOL for, um, for a while and, you know, eyewitness accounts conflicted with what the police said. But yeah, the, the evidence sort of disappeared for a while, which means that a, as much as the, the uh, you know, the probe, the investigation determined the officer was, you know, no wrongdoing on the part of the officer, there'd be no charges, everything like that. The judge in the case admonished them for, for messing with the evidence, saying that there will not be the, the necessary certainty for some communities in Toronto regarding this case. And Toronto does have uh, an issue in dealing with people in a state of distress who are mentally ill. And this may seem like small problems uh, to people who, who live in certain neighborhoods in the U.S. who have much bigger problems. And y yes, relatively they are, you know, uh, not uh, as glaring an issue uh, as some stuff that goes on in the U.S. But any time a person dies and they don't have to, it's something worth talking about, if that makes any sense. And so I just wanted people to know that this is the background of this whole um, thing. It's not that, and, and the other thing I should mention is that there was a very controversial program in, in the city of Toronto that was referred to as, as carding, that police could stop someone and record their information. So people's information um, 
was logged in the police system um, even though they, they were not accused of a crime, there was no suspicion they were part of a crime. They were, they were put in a police computer just because they happened to be walking along the street and, and the police decided to ask for their uh, identification. And so big deal, so what? Um, there's, there's stories, it, it just sort of broke this week that a, um, a law student was denied a police ride along despite having no criminal record. Um, the, the law student maintains that um, the, the reason he was denied was because information was in a police database um, because he'd been stopped and, and documented while well, in the company of people with criminal records. So it's, it's guilt by association. He didn't do anything wrong. He was guilty of no crime. But because he happened to be in the company of people with, with criminal records, he's a law student training to be a lawyer. This is not totally strange. Um, he is denied certain rights and privileges in society. And I think we can all agree that that's not an ideal situation. So these, these are the issues in the backdrop. Now, the demands, because you may not know, they, the Black Lives Matter protesters stopped the... Um, stopped the parade, like stalled the parade with the, the Prime Minister and bless Canada, you know, could you imagine if there was a stoppage in a parade with a US President? The Secret Service would be all over the place, you'd be rushed into a car, you know, especially since the Black Lives Matter protesters set off colored smoke grenades. And, uh, you know, here it's just like, what's going on? We're very chill here in Canada. but. So everything was fine there, you know, everybody was sort of chill, but the Black Lives Matter protesters insisted that Pride organizers sign a document, which was their demands. They had to sign a document agreeing to their demands uh, before they would allow the parade to proceed. And that's what's got a lot of people upset. Uh, I'm... I'm of two minds about it. Uh, because of the history of pride, I'm like, well, okay, that might be a bit of their own medicine. Uh, I do have an issue with one of the demands that is now, you know, the, the pride organizers have agreed to this demand, and, and I disagree that they should have agreed to it without any sort of discussion. Uh, most of the demands are reinstating of funding um, and, and more inclusionary practices. So, you know, more um, black, deaf, and hearing impaired interpreters. Uh, I don't know why the color of the interpreters matters, but I mean, obviously, accessibility is a big issue. And if, if they're lacking in that, then they're lacking in that. Um, uh, uh, return of the South Asian stage, which some people may not know, Toronto has a huge South Asian community. So the idea that they'd have their particular sort of corner of Pride Weekend diminished is, is pretty crazy when you consider how many South Asian people are, are in this city. I mean, it's a sizable South Asian population in Toronto. By 20, uh, I forget which, 2025 or something like that, there are predictions that Toronto might be as much as 20% South Asian. So big community to not have a presence at Pride. Um, and, but the one, you know, it's, it's stuff like this, more hiring of black trans women, uh, indigenous people, stuff like that. That's all very reasonable. The thing that, struck me wrong is the the eighth demand which was removal of police floats in the pride marches and parades and the explanation for that was that um, police presence does not communicate safety for some members of the black community the way it does for other people and I don't doubt that's true I mean there I you know I just told you guys about some of the the tensions in um, between between the black the black community in Toronto and, and the police. Um, you know, I grew up in a neighborhood where there, there was sort of a um, 
uh, issues with the police, it's, it's difficult because when you have a bad experience with people who are on paper supposed to protect you, it's a very real sense of betrayal. But I don't think that's really the issue here. I think that um, there, there has to be dialogue before you agree to ban any group. And I'm not saying it's just because it's the cops, uh, even though it is sort of fair to say, what, we're good enough to sit here and protect all of you so that you can have your open air parade in the middle of the city uh, safely, you know, and peacefully, but we're, we're not allowed to, um, you know, we're, we're not allowed to partake, like actually participate in it as police officers and, and show that we support Toronto's gay community as well. And it, it, I think this really does put, uh, police officers who are black and gay in a very difficult situation because this is forcing them to, to choose between elements of their identity. You know, you can't, stop being gay. So what, are they supposed to be police? Or are they supposed to just understand that they're less welcome at Pride because they're police officers? The police union is, is understandably furious about this. The, the police union um, made a statement. I don't have it up here right now, but um, maybe I'll, hopefully I'll find it for the video. But um, the, I, I have an issue with that, and it's not because um, it's not because it's the police. It's because it's any group, and I mean, to put this in perspective, a group called Queers Against Israeli Apartheid got more of a hearing than the police did in this matter. There's a big back and forth about the, this group called Queers Against Israeli Apartheid that a lot of people had issues with because it was bringing the Palestinian-Israeli conflict into the Pride Parade and, you know, this is all about inclusion, not about pitting one group against another group or, or saying a group is bad and everything like that. And that got more back and forth than this. You know, within 30 minutes, the organizers just caved. And I kind of understand why. Um, but I mean, the only the only sort of parachute out of this is the ninth demand, where uh, they they agreed to hold a public town hall within six months from today, um, and where Pride Toronto will present a an action plan on the demands. So hopefully there is some room for negotiation here, because I really think that the the exclusion of any group especially a group that, you know, for, for the police officers, it's all hands on deck on what would otherwise be a holiday weekend. That was the excuse that Mayor Rob Ford always used to not do pride, was that it was the Canada Day long weekend, he was going to his cottage with his family. But cops don't have that luxury. They have to work the event. It's a very large event, so people who wouldn't otherwise be scheduled to work would have to go down there because it's a large gathering on, on city streets. You, you need more police officers. And so, you know, that is really unfortunate. And like I said, it's not that I, I don't believe there is police-related trauma within certain communities within um, Toronto. It's just that healing has to start somewhere. And the whole purpose of not how pride began in Toronto, but what pride has become in Toronto is, is very much a symbol of how far we've collectively come. And so I think that any demand that excludes any group because of that, based on just just affiliation with a group, not a, you know, not a political position. I think that it, it's not right no matter who does it. It's not right that Pride cut the South Asian stage. It's not right that Black Lives Matter is saying you have to uh, remove police floats um, because this is a good opportunity for, 
for people to see the police in a different light and for police to see, you know, perhaps for certain police to see members of that community in a different light. Because let's face it, you can't judge either side as a monolith, can you? You, you shouldn't be leveling collective blame at any group. That's bigotry. And so I just think that in, in agreeing snap judgment, ag again, it wasn't a perfect circumstance. There was an element of, of duress here. But in agreeing to these demands and saying they're going to remove police floats, pride, I don't think the organizers thought it out. And like I said, if they would put themselves in the shoes of a, of a black gay cop, and, you know, I, I can hear some people now going, yeah, how likely is that? In a city like Toronto, very likely. Uh, we have a very diverse police force, and there are, there are gay police officers, a lot of lesbian police officers, um, and, you know, it's not fair to them. It's not fair to be put in the middle. It's not fair for the implication to be that one part of their identity is in inherent conflict with another part, which affects a third part of their identity in such a profound way. Um, I believe the police union called it a slap in the face. And they're not wrong. So I think this is a, a good example of something where there's an opportunity to enact a certain amount of revenge, which is, is what this does, it does feel like. There, there's an element of, of trying to show up the cops. And I, I get it. Part of trauma is sort of regaining control. But, um, you know, I, I think it's important to address the bad cops or bad police procedure without claiming all cops are bad or the institution of police work is across the board bad. And this is where you do need, need cooler heads, and, and this is what I hope. So, you know, I hope we'll, we'll end up being that they'll, they'll drop that requirement uh, upon, you know, you know cooler, cooler, cooler heads, more reflection. Now, what happens when they do that? I don't know. I don't know what the response will be, whether that'll be considering going back on their word or breaking a deal or I don't know. But uh, for those of you who, you know, because people were saying, why isn't it in the press? It's all over the press here. I don't know how much it made uh, U.S. news. So that's why I've, I've decided to talk about it here. Um, so I think we need some deep breaths after that. <laughs> um, so everybody breathe in. And out. And breathe in. And out. 